So this series of lectures, we're going to go ahead and talk about the price system and, as it says here, why and when markets deliver a high level of economic efficiency. And the price system is another word for essentially a market economy. But before we go too far into why price systems often deal, deliver a high level of efficiency, let's first think about, well, what other systems might we look at? because prices are not the only way to coordinate economic activity. This is what we call comparative economic systems. So looking at overall different ways of organizing economies and how different societies have undertaken organizing their economies. And as you can see here, there's at least a couple of broad questions that any society has to figure out as far as the economy goes. What's going to be produced, as it says, who and how, to produce it and who gets what. One of the standard undergraduate treatments of the subject is Heilbronner and Milberg's Making of Economic Society. This is a little bit outdated now, but I think it still offers some useful insights. And they essentially want to look at three different ways that economies are often organized. So Governments as we know them are not something that just springs up spontaneously. Governments, or states in the technical term, have to be built. It takes a long time to organize people from hunter-gatherers or un unorganized agriculturalists into societies where you have standard government offices and written codes of law and all that kind of stuff. And what we see is that in those societies, of course, we still often have a division of labor and trade in goods, but most of this revolves around tradition. In particular, things like your profession or how you're going to make your living is going to be whatever your parents did. And the sort of regulation of economic conduct is often through unspoken oral tradition. So that's essentially where people start or where different societies historically in their evolution have started. Then eventually, governments are invented and governments are built up slowly. And often, the earliest governments essentially are planned economies or institute planned economies because they require a certain amount of taxes or they coordinate directly um, workers and get them to give over crops and they get other people to do the gathering of these, and they use resources to build you know, big temples or pyramids or that kind of thing. So economic planning is something that actually arises pretty early in the evolution of human societies. Trade occurs even as far back as the Ice Age and Native Americans and you know, before the Roman Empire brings you know, civilization, so-called, to Europe. We certainly see people trading individually with each other. I have some arrowheads, you have some meat, let's trade. But we also see long-distance trade, so that we see things like seashells that are from the Pacific coast being traded all the way over to the other side of the Rockies. Or we see things like amber from northern Europe flowing to southern Europe. Trade in that sense, again, is very, very old and goes back probably as far as humans have had language. The idea of markets in the sense of the demand and supply model come relatively late. Most people from most of human history have been essentially subsistence farmers or hunters and gatherers and fairly self-sufficient. And most of their economic activity does not involve trading with other people. Once societies get to a high level of urbanization, once people start moving off the farm and into cities, then we start to see markets as we know them become the dominant way of organizing economic activity. So true markets emerge first in towns and cities, and we get increased specialization of labor and that kind of thing. And we have to wait for the Industrial Revolution, probably, before markets become the dominant way of organizing people's economic activity. I think Heilbronner and Milberg's 
categories are useful, but I think they leave some things out. And in particular, they sort of don't separate out two different issues, which are in fact distinct. And those two different issues are how, or how are resources owned? So is ownership public or private? And the idea of is there central planning or not? And these are, as it says here, two distinct things. They essentially want to look at a contrast between capitalism, as they see it, and classic communism. And they first wrote their book during the Cold War, so it's no surprise that they see things that way. But we can often see out there, say for instance, resources and companies being privately owned, but the state, the state government takes a large role in coordinating and guiding economic activity. And that would be what we call state capitalism. Or we could at least imagine every corporation out there, the leadership is elected by one man, one vote, but each corporation then runs its own business independently. And therefore we would have a kind of market socialism. So really there's a, an ability to mix these two things that is outside of the normal imagination. In particular, one thing we might notice is that, say for instance, during World War II in the United States, private ownership was maintained, but a very high level of government planning was brought in to direct resources towards the war effort. So one way of thinking about this is the kind of organization that happens under those conditions. Typically, say for instance, fascist economies maintained private ownership, but wanted to subordinate the needs of industry to those of the state. So they would sort of fall under, these, under this category. Potentially, you might look at Chinese capitalism today as falling into this category as well. There is private ownership, at least outside of the agricultural sector. Um, but there is also a very high level of central planning and again the needs of F economic producers are subordinated to those of the state. I've called this corner over here Jeffersonian capitalism because Jefferson's vision of what the United States would be was essentially a lot of small independent farmers. So this could be thought of as sort of mom and pop capitalism over here as well. Something to add here is that an organization essentially relies on economic planning to get people to work together. In an organization, of course, you don't renegotiate the price of doing each of your job duties every time it comes up. Essentially, there's a chain of command or a hierarchy, and you have a, a defined position, and you do what you're told. I mean, usually it's nicer than that, but that's essentially what it is when it comes down to it. So one author has described a modern market economy as nuggets of central planning in a sea of markets because each organization acts as a little centrally planned or command economy, but then they interact with each other through markets. And I think that's a good way to think about it. We've covered essentially two of the criteria on this slide already. The idea of property rights was the vertical axis in the last diagram. The idea of planning was the horizontal axis. But we didn't touch on the idea of distribution here. And notice we could have a publicly owned economy, but all the public resources are used to benefit the political elite. So that would be essentially a redistribution upwards, that is, position and power are used to increase income and wealth even further. Or we could have a publicly owned economy where the government undertakes to redistribute resources down towards people who are less powerful. So the issue of distribution is also distinct from planning and property rights. The last book I want to talk about here is Baumol and Latan. And this is a much more modern treatment of this idea of comparative economic systems than Heilbrunner and Milberg. This was written in, I believe, 2010. And Baumol and Lacan essentially begin with the observation that the debate between what we might call communism and what 
one might call capitalism, is essentially over. That some form of capitalism essentially is dominant in almost every country of the world. But not all versions of capitalism are the same. In fact, there are pretty distinct varieties of capitalism. And so they want to split it into two bad capitalisms and two good capitalisms. So one of their types of bad capitalism is state-guided capitalism. So in state-guided capitalism, the economy is subordinated to the desire of political leaders. And essentially, political leaders use their positions to gain further economic success, income, and wealth. So this is essentially a situation where the government dominates the economy and it, not in a sort of good way, but rather to reward political office holders. The other extreme on the bad, econ bad capitalism metric is what's called oligarchic capitalism. Here, the people who are the currently wealthy dominate the government and use that dominance of the government to preserve their wealth and transfer resources to them. So that's sort of also at the other extreme. Then there are two different types of good capitalism are what they call big firm capitalism and entrepreneurial capitalism. Under big firm capitalism, you do have large units of production because large companies can realize economies of scale that small companies can't. But we avoid any excessive concentration of market power and we don't allow anyone to monopolize it. So government does take a role to intervene to some degree and also essentially institutes some basic regulations. But aside from this, economists tend to be very skeptical that the government should get into the process of picking particular industries to make them larger, so picking winners and losers. Um, so sort of limited inter intervention in the economy, but a little bit of a separation of economy and government parallel to the separation of church and state, you might say. Then also, we want to make sure that we have entrepreneurial capitalism exist as well, that there are not huge barriers to entry for new firms to come into the market. Because while big firms are really good at being efficient by attaining an economy of scale, they're not necessarily very good at innovation. So we need to make sure that we encourage lots of innovation and entrepreneurial activity. Often, of course, what's going to happen, and we see this all the time in the tech industry, is that once an idea is proven successful in its sort of concept stage, you need a lot of resources to fully develop it into a marketable product. So often we see some flow back and forth between the entrepreneurial sector of the economy and the dominant or big firm sector of the economy because those big firms have the resources and the long-term planning capabilities to bring those entrepreneurial products to maturity here. And so you can see the key question in all this. The key question that divides good capitalisms from bad capitalisms in their way of thinking about things is, does the economic system channel talented, ambitious people into making pie or taking pie from others? And we really want talented, ambitious people to be channeled into making more pie. The two forms of bad capitalism channel talented, ambitious people into either seeking a position in government and using that to take pie, or seeking to dominate the government to take pie from other people. So again, we want people to sort of have an incentive to promote economic efficiency rather than just taking things from other people.